In this video, we'll derive the famous formula for the length of a vector in Cartesian coordinates. Or to put it in the language of linear algebra, we'll derive an expression for the length of a vector in component space with respect to a Cartesian basis. Now, the highlight of the video will be not so much the formula itself, which is completely ubiquitous and everybody knows it, but the fact that the formula can be expressed in the language of matrix products, which will really open the floodgates of linear algebra in this topic. Now, let me remind you what a Cartesian basis is. A Cartesian basis, we'll start in the plane, consists of vectors that are orthogonal to each other, and each is unit length. In the three dimensions, the definition is analogous. We have to have three vectors, all of which are orthogonal to each other, mutually orthogonal, which means any two are orthogonal, and all are unit length. Now, we have already used Cartesian bases in this course, and we have learned their great utility. But until now, it didn't matter that the vectors were unit length. What did matter that they were equal length. But because we didn't talk about lengths of vectors much, we didn't need them to be unit length. Well, now the fact that they're unit length will be of critical importance. And all of the answers that we obtain uh, would be different had these vectors not been unit length, even if they were equal length. And if these vectors are equal length but not unit length, I would no longer call this basis Cartesian. So we're going to work with Cartesian bases, and the fact that all vectors are unit length is important. Now, why do I keep saying a Cartesian basis instead of the Cartesian basis? Well, that's because there are many Cartesian bases. The definition that I just gave still allows for other bases that would still be called Cartesian. Why? Well, in two dimensions, we can rotate this basis and the vectors would still be orthogonal to each other and they would still be unit length and those alternative bases would also be called Cartesian. And you might say that there is a one parameter family of Cartesian basis that's parametrized by the angle by, by which you turn it. So all of these bases would be called Cartesian. And although we won't talk about it, you can also do this. You can exchange the bases where it would still be in this arrangement, but now you would call this E2 and this vector E1. Does it make much of a difference? Not when you talk about lengths. But there will be other problems where the order of the vectors, and especially later in three dimensions, well, not especially, just as much, matters quite a bit. So, all of these bases, including the flips, will be called Cartesian bases. And you have to realize that when we are in our physical world, there is one dimension that, that is more special than the rest. That's because we live in the gravitational field, and we really feel the up direction and it's special for us. But when you're talking about linear algebra in the plane or in the three-dimensional space, there is really no preferred direction. So one Cartesian basis is no better than another. So if you really want to develop your geometric interpretation, you might want to repeat all of the things we'll be doing in this and subsequent videos, but turn the basis and pay attention to what changes and what doesn't change. So, just to summarize, in one dimension, excuse me, in the plane, in two dimensions, we have a one parameter family of Cartesian bases, plus each one of them can be flipped. In the three dimensions, here's how we build Cartesian bases in three dimensions. If you think of this as E1 and this as E2, here's what happens. This plane will now be the horizontal plane, and we add another dimension, which is E3. So here is that basis, E1, E2, E3. So this is actually a pretty good drawing. And once again, we can rotate these bases whichever way we want, plus we can flip any two of the vectors. Okay, so forgetting about the flips for the moment, how many different parameters do you need to describe the orientation of a Cartesian basis in three dimensions? So in the plane, we said that it's a one, uh, parameter family, right? It's just the angle by which you turn the basis. So you would call this a one parameter family. In three dimensions, the rotations are much richer. You can do this, you can do this, you can do this, and you can also twist. So I'm not saying the answer is four. The answer actually is not four, but it's a great question to think about. And we'll answer this question when we talk about rotation and talk about Euler angles. 
Okay, I think that's it for the Cartesian, for what Cartesian bases are. Let's talk about the length of a vector and derive the famous formula. And the key to the derivation will, of course, be the Pythagorean theorem, which is made possible by the fact that this is the 90 degree angle, a 90 degree angle. Let's now derive that formula. Well, we have to figure out graphically what the components of the vector v are. So here's the setup. We have a Cartesian basis. I brought it over here because I don't want to mess with that drawing. We have a vector v, and this vector v is decomposed with respect to this basis. And its components are alpha 1 and alpha 2, which I can organize into a uh, pair of values. So this is an element of R2. I'm putting sub capital C here to remind us that these are the components of the vector V with respect to the Cartesian basis C. So that's what this sub C is. And I'm calling this element of R2 alpha. So you can think of alpha as a two by one matrix or as an element of R2. Of course, the two types of elements, types of objects are really mixed together. And let's also remind ourselves of what it means to measure the length in the physical space, in the real space. Well, there's essentially just one way to measure the length of a vector, and that's to pick up a tape measure, put it up against the vector, and read off the value 13 and a half inches. I don't have a metric tape. Okay, so now that we have the length of the vector in the real space, here is our goal. Our goal is to come up with a mathematical expression that would lead, uh, that would yield the same answer, 13 and a half inches, and that expression needs to be in terms of alpha 1 and alpha 2. So our goal is set. We have to come up with an expression for the length of the vector in the component space, where the components of the vector are alpha 1 and alpha 2. And it's not hard to do. Let's figure out in this picture what the components of the vector are. And of course you have to draw these two projections. That's how you find the components of a vector. And the length of this segment right here is of course, well this is the right angle, that's important, because these lines that we just drew have to be parallel to these vectors, so this gives us a 90 degree angle here. And the length of this segment right here is alpha 1. This right here is alpha 1. And it's alpha 1 it's precisely because the vector E1 is unit length. Had the vector E1 not been unit length, this segment right here would not equal alpha 1. It would equal the length of E1 times alpha 1. We'll discuss that in a separate video. Good question to think about on your own, but we'll discuss it probably in the next video. So if the length of the vector E1 were 10, then the length of this segment would be called 10 times alpha 1. Because alpha 1 is the number by which you need to multiply E1 to yield this vector right here. That's what decomposition means. But because E1 is unit length, this segment right here is precisely alpha 1. So we're using all properties of Cartesian basis orthogonality shows up right here, and the fact that this is, in fact, alpha 1 comes from the fact that E1 is unit length. Uh, this point is as simple as it is subtle, so we'll discuss it in a separate video. And of course, this segment right here is alpha 2 by the exact same argument. All right, and now we'll look at this triangle right here and use the Pythagorean theorem, which tells us that this hypotenuse has length alpha 1 squared plus alpha 2 squared, nothing but Pythagoras theorem, and we need to put it under the square root. Nobody likes square roots, but it is there. We're going to get rid of it in the next line. And the famous ubiquitous formula for the length of a vector in component space with respect to a Cartesian basis has been derived. Will this formula be different if we chose a different Cartesian basis? What would change? 
What would stay the same? Let's not rush through this question. So our basis was this, of course not to scale, but essentially this. And we have our alpha 1 and alpha 2, and this is the expression for the length. Now what if the basis had been this? What would change? What would be the same? Well, these would be two new vectors, not E1 and E2 anymore, but you pick a different letter, D. And of course, the components will change. The basis changes, so the components change. But we would once again use the same sort of argument, use the Pythagorean theorem one more time, and it will obtain the same kind of expression, although the values of the coefficients would be completely different, and maybe the names of the components would be different. So yes, the names of the components should be different because they're components with respect to a different basis. But in terms of those new components, it will be the exact same expression. So this expression is relatively versatile. Yes, it's limited to Cartesian bases. Yes, it would be entirely different if the basis was not Cartesian. But it does work for all Cartesian bases. And if you choose a different Cartesian basis, the components will change. But if you use those new components and once again combine them in this expression, you will get the same number, 13 and a half inches. And if the basis was not Cartesian, totally different expression. Here's what we're going to do in probably the next video. We will take E1 and stretch it by a factor of 3. So it will still be an orthogonal basis, but no longer Cartesian. The vectors won't even be equal length. Uh, one will be length 3 and the other one will remain length 1. And what will be the corresponding expression? It will be different. If you'd like to figure out that question before you watch that video, that would be great. All right, so we're done. We have derived the famous expression for the length of a formula, for the length of a vector in a Cartesian basis. And here comes the best part of this video. What we're going to do now is capture this result in the language of matrices. We're going to come up with an expression that only uses alpha and interprets it as this two by one matrix, but doesn't make any explicit references to alpha one or alpha two. So it only uses alpha and whatever matrix operations you choose. You can use addition, multiplication, the transpose. So the goal is to come up with a matrix expression in terms of alpha that will produce this result. So you should probably pause the video right now and try to come up with that expression yourself. But before you do, I think that it's best to get rid of the square root. Nobody likes square roots. So instead of talking the length of v, we'll talk about the length squared of v, which of course equals simply alpha 1 squared plus alpha 2 squared. And there you go. So now let's come up with a matrix expression in terms of alpha that evaluates to alpha 1 squared plus alpha 2 squared. So go ahead, pause the video and figure it out for yourself. But here comes the answer. What we're looking here is a number. So we have to come up with a matrix product that results in a one by one matrix. And of course, one by one matrices are equivalent to numbers. And with the matrix alpha, which is two by one, there is really only one way to do it, which is to multiply alpha as a row, alpha one, alpha two, by the column alpha 1, alpha 2. Okay, so we have a 1 by 2 matrix multiplying a 2 by 1 matrix. So the result is a 1 by 1 matrix as desired. And of course, that 1 by 1 matrix is alpha 1 squared plus alpha 2 squared. So it indeed evaluates to length squared of V. But remember, our contract was to not use alpha 1 and alpha 2 explicitly, and we're doing just fine with the second matrix because that's alpha. And what is this matrix as a row? Well, that's simply alpha transpose. So the expression that we're looking for is alpha transpose alpha. How nice is this? It's super short. It uses alpha as a block object. It doesn't make any specific references to the entries of alpha. And it evaluates to the right answer. So it's a very attractive expression. And we have, have of course, talked about the transpose operation before. But until now, I have really been reluctant 
to talk about it because we haven't had any real applications for it. Well, all of that changes now. Now that we're talking about links and in a very short period of time about dot products, the transpose operation will play a crucial role and it will stay with us front and center for the rest of the course and for the rest of our careers. So now is the time for the transpose to shine. So I would like to leave you with an interesting question. So suppose we have two vectors, V and W, and V has components alpha 1 and alpha 2, and W, which I may draw in, W right here, has components beta 1 and beta 2. And I told you we were going to talk about angles, so the question is, how would you express the angle between these two vectors? Maybe the cosine of the angle between two vectors in terms of alpha 1, alpha 2, and beta 1 and beta 2. And if you're able to obtain that expression, try to convert it to matrix form, like this, that only uses uh, matrices, these co combinations of coefficients as block elements, as matrices, doesn't make any individual references to any of the components. So we will actually answer that question. You can try it. It involves a little bit of trigonometry. But we will answer this question later when we talk about dot products. Because as you will find out, dot products are about the combination of lengths and angles and a whole lot more. So dot products are coming in just a few videos. But for now, we will dwell a little bit on talking about lengths in component spaces.